Lord, have 
Jesus, breathe within. Lord, have your way. Lord, have your way in me. Like a mighty storm, stir within my soul. Lord, have your way.
morning. Thank you for who you are. Lord, thank you for all, Lord, all that you're doing in us, as you are the author and finisher of our faith. Lord, what an amazing promise that is, Lord, that you will complete this work that you've begun in each one of us. And Lord, we can feel you stirring up the dross in us now. As an individual, as the church, Lord, you're just stirring things up, Lord, preparing your bride for your coming. Lord, we wait in anticipation for the sound of that trumpet. Maranatha, we long to see your face. Go before us now in all that we say and do. And Lord, we just lift up our brother Joey to you this morning, and the loss of his dad. We pray for peace and comfort for the family, peace and comfort for him. And Lord, I just pray, Lord, that you do a mighty work there as, as he witnesses to his family. We ask it and pray it in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. And welcome, welcome, Facebook Live. Welcome to our electronic church and uh, all of those smiling faces we see here this morning. What a wonderful, wonderful surprise this was. It was nice to see you all come out. Thank you. Must have been the chicken. Keith, we have enough communion as you go around? Okay. Joe, I have to do this this morning? Good. I just did it anyway. You should have told me that before I did it. <laughs> Open your Bibles if you would. By the way, this morning is Agape Sunday. It is a communion Sunday. If finally it's here. It's not what I said was here two weeks ago, but this is actually the date today. So we um, are going to have communion this morning. So if you're with us live, please stay with us as we will continue to run right through. Just run the last worship song, everything right on through. And uh, you will get to join us for communion and for the end of worship. So Revelation chapter 3, and we're going to really go hard at this letter today. We're going to get through probably a, a mind-numbing two verses. <laughs> Listen, this is, uh, well, before we get into that, this letter, um, as we have in the last couple of letters, has an application for each of us, has an application for the churches. So just as a matter of review, let's go through them again. The first church we looked at was the church of Ephesus. In Ephesus, we learned to guard against losing our first love. And then there was Smyrna. and Smyrna, we learned about faith over our fear. Pergamum, we learned not to compromise our faith. And in Thyatira, we learned about not tolerating sin in the body of Christ. In Sardis, we learned the importance of keeping our faith alive. And today, in the Church of Philadelphia, we're going to look at what the Lord sees as a good church, what constitutes a good church in the eyes of the Lord. All these letters are important, no doubt. But I believe personally that this letter, the letter to Philadelphia, is the most important of them all because this is really going to teach us something about the church and about ourselves. It's important to know, isn't it, what God considers to be a good church. So we're probably going to spend a couple of weeks in this letter, at least two. Um, because, listen, his opinion is the only opinion that matters, isn't it? I mean, we talk to our friends, and our friends will try to lure us out to their church, and they'll say, listen, our church has great worship. Not that ours doesn't, but our church has great worship. Or our church has an awesome children's church. Or, or we have a cafe or a bookstore or we do a lot of outreaches, or, or we just have a big church. You know, you've heard them all. It goes on and on and on. And, and, and listen, the bigger the church doesn't necessarily, there's nothing wrong with big churches. There's nothing wrong with having a bookstore. There's nothing wrong with having a cafe. There's nothing wrong with any of those things. But those things in and of themselves do not make for a good church. Amen? So Jesus describes the church of Philadelphia as not a big church. But rather, he says, you have little strength. And so he's telling them that they're small in number, in influence, and resources, yet they are.
are mighty, and we're going to look real close as what makes this little church so mighty and powerful. Because we want to know, don't we? We want to know what God considers a good church. So we, as the church, can strive to be that church that is a good church in the eyes of God. And so let's dig into this by first looking at the history of this church in Philadelphia. And we do that by addressing the address, where, it is, where this letter is addressed to, and it's addressed to the city of Philadelphia. So as we go along our ancient postal route, the next stop on the route, the next to the last stop, is the city of Philadelphia. Philadelphia is about 30 miles, um, a 30-mile walk from Sardis, so we can easily do that in an hour or two. And we know that, uh, I know you're all looking at me. I slip them in there once in a while, just as if you're awake. So obviously you're not. So what does the name Philadelphia mean? You scholars out there, oh, you all knew that answer. Maybe it's because we're so close to Philadelphia. But I, don't, I bet you don't know where that name came from. The city of Philadelphia was established in 189 B.C. by King Eumenes II of Pergamum. And King Eumenes II named the city for his younger brother and successor, by the way, Attalus II. Attalus' loyalty and love for his brother was notable. And so he even adopted, or they even gave him, rather, the nickname Philadelphius, which literally means one who loves his brother. And that's how Philadelphia became known as the city of brotherly love. Not so much brotherly love going on there in that last couple of weeks, but it is the city of brotherly love. This city that we're going to look at this morning was the youngest of the seven churches. And it was founded as a missionary city. Now, not in the same regard as we would think a missionary city, right? A missionary city would be the spread to what? The gospel message. Their mission was to spread the Greek language and culture. They were spreading, they were trying to Hellenize the whole area around them. Barclay, who was a um, commentator, mentions that they were so successful, successful that by A.D. 19, the Lydians had forgotten their own language and were all but Greeks. So you can see they did their job very, very well spreading the Greek culture. This city had gained the name Little Athens because of the worship of all the Greek gods, and they were all there, and of course, chief among them was Zeus. The city had become the center for the worship of Greek gods, gods rather, and so there were temples to these gods all throughout this city as it was in the other cities. Now, Barclay also says that Philadelphia commanded one of the greatest highways in the world, the highway which led from Europe to the east. He goes on to say that Philadelphia was the gateway from one continent to another. So being a gateway city and open to all that trade would make Philadelphia a very wealthy city. Philadelphia, however, sat along a fault line as Sardis did. And in A.D. 17, that area was hit with a massive earthquake. It was such an unstable area that two years after the quake, the Greek historian Stabro wrote, Philadelphia has not even its walls secure, but they are daily shaken and split in some degree. The people continually pay attention to earth tremors and plan their buildings with this factor in mind. This is two years after the earthquake. Many people died in that quake, and the city was decimated by it, and many continued to be injured even as they tried to rebuild the city. The emperor at that time was Tiberius, and Tiberius helped Philadelphia out with their rebuilding effort by putting a hold on taxation for two years. And so they were so grateful to him that they even changed the name of the city for a season to Neo Caesarea, which means the new Caesar. Now, some of these people, obviously, were afraid to go back into the city. I mean, if your city was constantly quaking and shaking, you wouldn't want to live inside of a, of a building. So they started setting up places outside the city and living outside the city, planting vineyards, which were used, those grapes began to be used for wine, which led to yet another Greek god being worshipped, the god Dionysus. So 
that's kind of the story or the history behind Philadelphia. Today, there stands a modern city on top of the ruins of that city called Alasir, which means the city of God. This gives us some history and insight as to what the people there, the church there, was dealing with. This city, mind you, was no different than any other cities we've looked at. There was idol worship. There was emperor worship. There was sexual immorality. There was hedonism. It was all here in this city. Yet, unlike the other churches we've looked at so far, the entire church in Philadelphia kept itself apart, set apart from the world around it, and focused squarely on Jesus and doing the will of Jesus. So let's look at chapter 3, verse 7, the very first part. And to the angel of the church in to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write. And so we know that this letter is addressed to the church. It's going to the city of Philadelphia, addressed to the church of Philadelphia. It's important to note that there were two churches that Jesus had no nothing bad to say against, no condemnation for. One of them is Philadelphia. Does anyone remember what the other one was? Smyrna. So those are the only two churches that Jesus had nothing bad to say about. And churches today want to be or even claim to be the church in Philadelphia. I mean, obviously we have Calvary Chapel of Philadelphia, but everyone wants to be the church of Philadelphia. And, what, and that makes them unique, doesn't it? Because you never hear anybody say, I want to be the church of Sardis. Or we want to be the church of Smyrna, the persecuted church. No one wants to be that church. Everyone wants to be the church of Philadelphia. So what makes this church so special? And, and is it a model? Is this what Jesus intended for us to see? Is this a model of what the church was intended to be? So let's dig into this church and see what God considers to be a good church. And Jesus begins this by describing himself as he does in all the other letters. Look at the last part of verse 7. These things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. Jesus said these words in such a way that we have to look at them as separate and distinct. And we are going to study them that way this morning. It helps us, it's going to help us, know the character of the God that we serve. Know the character of the God who is over the church, what he, who he is, and what he expects of his church. Because remember, the way Jesus describes himself in these letters is a message in and of itself, isn't it? It's a message to each individual church. And so Jesus begins his message with, God is holy. Now it's interesting to note that in the Bible there are only two times when the words holy, holy, holy Lord are used, once in the New Testament and once in the Old Testament. It's also interesting to note that the two times it was used, it was revealed to two men who had been given a vision of God. So this is what God said to Isaiah, or this is what Isaiah saw, rather, in the Old Testament. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory, Isaiah 6.3. And in the book of Revelation, this is what John saw. The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Revelation chapter 4, verse 8. So God is holy meaning that he's separate from all things sinful and evil. God can't tolerate sin. God can't even look upon sin, which creates a problem for sinful man, doesn't it? The fact that God's holy is one of his attributes. But it's, it's an attribute that no human, it's not in, inherent in humans. It's not something that we naturally are. You see, God is holy, but we become holy when we come to Jesus Christ. Amen? Now, in the, in the vision that Isaiah was given, the holiness of God that Isaiah saw led him to fall on his face, keenly aware of his sinfulness. 
In the vision John receives of the same God, yet he doesn't have the same reaction that Isaiah had. There's not that falling on his face and awareness of sin. Not that John wasn't with sin, but perhaps it's because at the beginning of this letter, if you remember, the risen Christ laid his hand on John's shoulder and said, do not fear. Jesus comforts him right from the very beginning, giving him confidence that he can come into the throne room of God as a sinner, just as we can, right? Hebrews 4.16, come boldly into the throne room of into the throne where we can obtain mercy and grace and to help in our time of need. Is there any? Is there a time when we're ever without, or with, or a time where rather when we never need God? We're always in need. We always need Him, so we can always come boldly into His throne room of grace without fear of our sin, because the righteousness of Jesus Christ was exchanged for our sin. God no longer sees us as sinners for those who believe. God sees us covered in the blood of His Son. He sees us as righteous. Because we're covered with the righteousness of Christ. And the cool thing about Isaiah and John being given a vision of God, first in the Old Testament and then the New Testament, is because it reminds us that God is the same in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. The picture that John and, and Isaiah saw was a unified picture of God who doesn't change. Malachi 3.6, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews 13.8. And with whom there is no variation or shadow or turning, James 1.17. God's holiness is eternal. From beginning to end, there is no end. God's holiness is eternal. And because God is holy, we are called to be what? Holy. That's what Peter wrote. Because it is written, be holy for I am holy. 1 Peter 1.16. So being holy is more than just being morally upstanding. It's being set apart from the world. That's what holy really means. It sets us apart from this world. And as we discussed, as we talked about, this message that the way Jesus describes himself is a message to the church. It's a message to us. So the first thing we learn about a good church is that a good church in the eyes of Jesus is one that is set apart from the world around us. That's number one. A good church in the eyes of Jesus is one that is set apart from the world around us. Not all churches that Jesus addressed in these letters were set apart from the world, were they? Pergamum and Thyatira, just to name two, had given themselves over to sexual immorality and the worship of idols. Sardis had become very hedonistic and materialistic. And so the church is in the world for a reason, isn't it? The church has been placed in the world. The church, these churches, if you remember, were placed in these hedonistic, materialistic, sexually immoral cities for a reason. Not just so that the world could creep in, but that the world could be salt, and the church rather, could be salt and light to the world. Salt is a preservative. As believers, we are to preserve this world, and especially the church, from the decay of sin. Salt has flavors. One commentator wrote, Christians living under the guidance of the Holy Spirit and in obedience to Christ will inevitably influence the world for good. As salt has a positive influence on the flavor of food, it seasons where there is strife, we are to be peacemakers. Where there is sorrow, we are to be ministers of Christ, binding up wounds. And where there is hatred, we are to exemplify the love of God in Christ, returning good for evil. So listen, listen, a church influenced by the world cannot influence the world for good. Let me say that again. A church that is influenced by the world cannot influence the world for good. We've lost our saltiness. We've put out the light, which is what's next. A church is to be a light in the darkness, not part of the darkness. Jesus said in his Sermon on the Mount, You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that, you may see, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. You know, do people see our light when we post stuff on, on social media? Is there a light there? 
or if we step sometimes out of the light and into the darkness, into the shadows. You know, if we're a light, we're a light everywhere we go, right? Not just in church, not just in front of other Christians, but everywhere we go. We're a light to the world. And that's both in person and in print and in thought and in all of those things. As a church, we're to shed the light, our light, in this dark world. We're, we are, listen, when we see darkness and evil all around us, the only way to counteract that evil is by sharing the light of the word of God. That's what dispels the darkness. It's not taking sides on one issue or another. It's taking the only side for us as Christians, and that's Jesus Christ. Paul said, that's why I preach him and him crucif Jesus and him crucified. That's the only power there is. In every church we've read about so far, each one of them had been planted in a very worldly place. We're planted in the middle of the world, aren't we? We're planted right here. Jesus could have taken us out of here, but he's left us here for a reason, to be that salt, to be that light to the world around us. Instead of a lot of these churches we've read about being set apart from the world, they allowed the world to become a part of the church. And we see that so often today. The church, instead of being set apart from the world, has allowed the world into the church. Listen, the Bible is very clear about becoming part of the world. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15-16 through 16 tells us, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. So to be a church that Jesus established on the rock, a church that Jesus said the gates of hell would not prevail against, is to be a church that is separated, set apart from this world, not a part of it. Amen? The second way that Jesus describes himself is true. Now, we know this is a description of Jesus because Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. John 14, 6. The author of Hebrews writes, By two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie. God is truth. There is no lie in God. God cannot lie. And he wants his church, he wants his people to be a church of truth, a people of truth. Listen to what Paul writes to Timothy. These things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly. But if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 through 15. So the second characteristic of a good church of what God considers a good church is a church that stands for the truth again not every church that we've read about so far has stood for the truth the church of Thyatira for instance had fallen for the lies of the self-proclaimed prophetess Jezebel and that and her teachings led them into sin didn't they Listen, when you do not stand for the truth, you will fall for the lies every single time. And in church today, in a lot of churches today, we find them falling for the lie. And I'm just going to hit on a couple of hot topics here, but homosexuals serving in the church, teaching from the pulpits. Where is that in the word of God? That's a lie. That's deception. But yet the church has allowed the world in, has allowed the lies in. A quick search on the internet will tell you that there are churches out there that support women's choice to have abortions. There's racism in the church. Everything that we see in the world is in the church, and it ought not to be. We are to be a place, a pillar of truth in our communities. The church has allowed, allowed the lies of the world in because the truth of the word of God is absent or marginalized in those churches. Many of the churches today will not speak out against sin for fear of the backlash that will come from the world. World opinion means more to the church today than the word of God does. So the church that God considers a good church is a church that stands firm on the words of God and keeps 
out the ways of the world out of the church. And then the next part that Jesus, how Jesus describes himself is the key of David. So the key of the house of David in Isaiah 22, 22, we're told, I will lay on his shoulder so he shall be open and no one shall shut and shall shut and no one shall open. Sound familiar? That's in Isaiah 22, 22. This verse in Isaiah 22 is in reference to authority. And God said that he would have his servant Eliakim and he would place this key of authority upon him. And he had the authority both to open the treasury of the king and to determine who got to have an audience with the king. So the authority was placed on Eliakim and that is, that, that's an illustration by the key is placed on his shoulder. And so when we compare that to Isaiah chapter 9, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and peace. Isaiah 9, verses 6 through 7. All authority, heaven and earth, has been placed upon Jesus. And that's the third mark of a good church in the eyes of Jesus is one that recognizes the authority and deity of Jesus. Now you would think that every church would hold to the deity of Jesus Christ. You figure of all the things we have in common, that would be one of them, right? But we see from these letters, these just these seven letters, which by the way represent seven real churches, the seven churches through the ages, but also represent churches today, the Christians today. Take the church of Sardis, for instance. Many in that church had returned to Judaism to avoid being persecuted for not worshiping the emperor, right? Remember that part of the problem in that church was the Jews in the synagogue did not want the Jewish Christians in the synagogue unless they denounced Christianity. And so to denounce Christianity is to denounce Jesus who said, Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Matthew 10, verses 32 through 33. Any church, or any believer for that matter, that does not believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and God the Son has denied the deity of Jesus Christ. You know, just to point out, and I'm not going to pick on them, but one church that denies the deity of Jesus Christ are Jehovah Witnesses. They believe that Jesus was an incarnation of Michael the archangel. And that although he was pre-existent, he's not equal to God. They deny the deity of Jesus Christ. And that's just one. The church of God that God considers to be a good church would never deny the deity of Jesus Christ, but would defend that deity on every single level. And so that brings us to the last way that Jesus describes himself, and that is as an open door. Jesus opens a door that no one can shut, and shuts the door that no one can open. And that has multiple interpretations for us, actually. We know that Jesus is the door to eternal life, right? Because he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father, no one goes to heaven except through me. John 14, 6. Jesus is the door to our blessings. James writes in chapter 1, verse 17, For every good and perfect gift is from above, and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Jesus opens the door also for us to minister, doesn't he? Now the city of Philadelphia, as we looked at when we looked at the history of the city, was a missionary city, and its mission was to spread the Greek culture and Greek language because it was considered a gateway city that went from one continent to another. And so this is a perfect door to be open to evangelize, isn't it? And perhaps Jesus is telling them that I've opened that door for you to, to evangelize from one continent to the other. And this door that I've opened to you, no one will shut. Not the Roman authorities, not any governors anywhere. No one will shut this door. You have, my, you have it on my authority that you have an open door to spread the gospel. And perhaps that's what Jesus is telling them here. We find an example of that in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 16, verses 6 through 10, we read, they went through the region of 
of Phrygia and Galatia, having been prevented by the Holy Spirit, did you hear that? Having been prevented by the Holy Spirit from speaking the message in, that, in the province of Asia. When they came to Myasia, they attempted to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them to do this. So they passed through Myasia and went to Tros. A vision appeared to Paul during the night. A Macedonian man was standing there urging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul saw the vision, he attempted immediately to go to Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to proclaim the good news to them. So we see through the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit leading and guiding them as to where opening doors and closing doors. But no matter what Jesus is referring to here, all of these are possible because all of them are true. And that brings us to point number four and five of what God considers to be a good church. Number four, a good church is a witness for Jesus Christ to the ends of the earth. It faithfully obeys the Great Commission. Now, some of the churches Jesus addressed here did more to spread the lies of the enemy by condoning the ways of the world in the church than they did to spread the gospel message and be a witness for Jesus Christ. And number five, a good church is led by the Holy Spirit, obeying his leading and guiding. The church of Sardis, remember, had not experienced the complete work of the Holy Spirit in their lives. They were so involved in the world that they left the Holy Spirit out of everything they did. And therefore, on the outside, they looked like a, a church that was alive and vibrant. But on the inside, they were dead. Their works were dead. And that brings us to Revelation chapter 3, verse 8. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door that no one can shut. For you have a little strength. You have kept my word and have not denied my name. Now, listen, we're looking this morning at what God considers a good church. And so if you were asked before this message this morning what you thought would be a good church, <clears throat> maybe you would say a good church is a church that loves, right? I mean, a loving church is a good church. That seems like a pretty solid answer. Who doesn't want to be part of a loving church, right? We all want to be part of a loving church. So you would think that a loving church would be the church that God looks favorably upon. Well, all we have to do is look at the book of Acts, because that's where the church was what? Born. The church was born in the book of Acts. And so we look in the book of Acts to see what the Lord would consider to be a good church. This is where the church is established. Did you know that the word love is not mentioned anywhere in the book of Acts? It's not mentioned anywhere. It's mentioned eight times in the book of Revelation. It's mentioned 39 times in John's Gospel and 14 times in 1 Corinthians, which includes the love chapter. But it's not found even once in the book of Acts. You know why? Because what we do find in the book of Acts is the apostles' acts of love toward God through their obedience and faithfulness to his word. They show the love of God. What does Jesus say? If you love me, you will what? Obey me. Keep my commandments. And so they showed love for God by obeying his commandments, by following the leading and guiding of the Holy Spirit. And that's what we see in the church of Philadelphia. Jesus says this about this mighty little church. I have set a door an open door before you that no one can shut. Now, we've heard this before, right? And again, there's a few ways to interpret this. But one of those ways, as we looked at, is eternal life. It's the door to eternal life. And in Revelation 4, we're going to read, After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. Revelation 4.1. So there's a door open to us, all who have a relationship with Jesus Christ, there's a door open for us in heaven. But again, Jesus could have meant a door to blessings or to ministry as we looked at before. But Jesus tells us that there are three main characteristics of a good church. It doesn't rely on its own strength, number one. Number two, it keeps the word of God. And number three, it does not deny the name of Jesus. Now, by telling this little church that they're little in strength, Jesus is no way telling them that they're weak. They're not weak. On the contrary, they're small but powerful. 
because their strength didn't come from anything they did. It didn't come from within. It didn't come from themselves. It came from God. And they were humble to admit that they couldn't do anything in their own strength. Their weakness was made strong through God. The fact that they had a little strength brought glory and honor to God as they relied on Him for His strength. They lived out the verses, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. They lived out the verse that said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in your weakness, 2 Corinthians 12, 9. The church in Philadelphia knew that they needed the strength of God to persevere, so they leaned on him for everything. This church wasn't powerful in any way. It didn't have powerful influence. It didn't have a lot of resources. It wasn't very big, but though but because of that, they leaned on God for everything and trusted in him for everything that they did. So a good church, in the eyes of God, is a church that relies on God for their resources. That's number six. Now Sardis, as we read, was very hedonistic and very materialistic. That church relied on its own resources and its own strength. You see any churches like that today? Well, let me give you an example of what a ministry with no money, with very little resources, can do when they rely on God and trust fully in Him. Have you ever heard the name George Mueller? George Mueller ran an orphanage in Bristol, England. He had no money of his own. God provided every little bit of money that that orphanage had without George's help. George didn't have, he didn't work for it. He didn't make appeals for it. He trusted in God for everything. And here's an example of what his faith in God, how his faith in God, rather, supplied all his needs. Now, talking about the orphanage, the children are dressed and ready for school, but there's no food for them to eat. The house mother of the orphanage informed George Mueller. George asked her to take the 300 children into the dining room and have them sit at tables. He thanked God for the food and waited. George knew God would provide food for the children, as he always did. Within minutes, a baker knocked on the door. Mr. Mueller, he said, last night I could not sleep. Somehow I knew that you would need bread this morning. I got up and baked three batches for you. I will bring it in. Soon there was another knock at the door. It was the milkman. His cart had broken down in front of the orphanage, and the milk would spoil by the time the wheel was fixed, and he asked George, if he could use some free milk. George smiled as the milkman brought in 10 large cans of milk. It was enough to feed 300 thirsty children. So it sounds like George Miller had great faith, doesn't it? Yet he always denied that he had great faith. He said, think not, dear reader, that I have the gift of faith. That is, that gift of which we read in 1 Corinthians 12, 9, and which is mentioned along with the gifts of healing. The working of miracles, prophecy, in that account, I am able to trust the Lord. It is true that the faith which I am able to exercise is altogether God's own gift. It is true that he alone supports it and that he alone can increase it. It is true that moment by moment I depend upon him for it and that if I were only for one moment left to myself, my faith would utterly fail. But it is true that my faith is the gift of faith which is spoken of in 1 Corinthians 12, 9. George Mueller was of little strength. He had no major influence. He had very, very little resources, none, if you want to look at it that way. But his faith in God for God's provision was mighty indeed. And so the second characteristic of, of a good church in the eyes of God is a church that keeps his word. Now, that word kept in the Greek is tereo, or tereo, rather. And it means to guard or to look after. The psalmist wrote, Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you, Psalm 119.11. He keeps the word of God in his heart, the psalmist says, so that he does not sin against God. So to keep the word of God is to know the word of God. You can't guard or look after something you know nothing of, can you? God said to his prophet Isaiah, Upon this one I will look on him who is poor and of a contrite spirit who trembles at my word, Isaiah 66 2. 
So God looks upon those who tremble at his word. That word tremble means to fear or respect. One commentator put it like this. When he says tremble at the word, that means when you and I face the word of God, we are awed by it. We are struck by it. We are affected by it. We are impressed by it. Something happens to us when we read the word of God. So the first thing that Satan attacks is the word of God, isn't it? This is one of the first things he attacked in the garden. He said to Eve, has God indeed said you shall not eat from every tree in the garden? Is that what God really said to you? Can you trust God? And the enemy has been attacking God's word ever since. The enemy whispers in our ears, did God really say that? Does the word of God really say that? Does God's word really prevent you from doing that? He's trying to get us to doubt the voice of God, the word of God, and get us to believe in a lie just as he did with Eve. Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. John wrote, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. One author said, The heart of God delights in is a heart that is compliant, cooperative, and responsive to him and his commands, a heart that obeys. So to keep the word of God, is to show our love for God. And a big part of that love is obedience. God prefers our obedience over our sacrifices. Isn't that what the Word tells us? To obey the Word of God is to surrender to God. A heart completely surrendered to Him is a heart that is inclined to do His will. A heart that is inclined to obey His commandments. Amen? And so the mark number seven of a church that God in the eyes of God is a good church is a church that keeps and guards the word obeys the word and trembles at the word of God now listen only a small remnant of the churches we looked at so far guarded the word of God kept the word of God most of those churches had abandoned the word for the ways of the world didn't they and that's exactly what happens when you abandon the word You wind up in the world. And so the next characteristic of a good church is a church that does not deny the name of Jesus. The word deny in the Greek means to contradict, to disavow, and to reject. And all three of those aspects can be found in denying the name of Jesus. Number one, we deny him by not acknowledging who he says he is. 1 John 2, verses 22-23 says, Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? That is the Antichrist. But who denies the Father and the Son? No one denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father. So to to deny that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that Jesus is the Messiah, is to reject him as Lord and Savior. Second, we deny him by not acknowledging him to others. Matthew chapter 10, Jesus said, So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. We can confess that Jesus is Lord with our mouth. We can even believe it in our heart, but to not deny him by not confessing him before others? That's an issue, isn't it? The church in Smyrna confessed Jesus to the world around them, And we're killed for that profession of faith. And sometimes we won't profess Jesus as Lord because we're fearful of what others would say or think about us. There are those who profess the name of Jesus Christ and be willingly killed for that profession and others who are embarrassed to profess the name of Christ for fear of what others would think or say about us. To deny Jesus by not acknowledging him in front of others is to disavow him as Lord of your life. So the proper way, the only way to profess Jesus Christ is with confidence and boldly that he is the Lord of our lives, no matter what the consequences of that profession is. Amen? And the third way we deny him is by our actions. Paul wrote to Titus, they profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. 
And listen, perhaps this is the scariest one of all, and prayerfully it will lead anyone who hears this to conviction and repentance if this is going on in your life. To proclaim Jesus with your lips and then live in contradiction to that proclamation is to deny Jesus. The way we live con contradicts the words we speak. That's the denial that Jesus is Lord of your life. I love the way one commentator puts this. Our lust is a denial of God's good plan for sexual desire. Our pride is a denial of God's place as center of all things. And our disobedience is a denial of God's role as rightful Lord of all creation. So a good church in the eyes of God is one that does not deny Jesus in word or in deed. Now the churches we've covered so far have denied the name of Jesus by the very sinful acts that they were committing. They denied the name of Jesus by worshiping false gods. They denied the name of Jesus by not, by not, by not proclaiming him as Lord of their lives. So they rejected, disavowed, and contradicted the name of Jesus. So the, a good church in the eyes of Jesus is one that will never deny his name no matter what. So what's the application for us? Well, the application is the eight points that we've already made, and we're going to go through them one by one again. Number one, a good church is a church that is set apart from the world around us. Listen, we let the world in in so many ways, don't we? But one of the most destructive, one of the most divisive ways is through the social gospel. Have you ever heard the social gospel? The social gospel is when you take something that's going on in the world around you, a social issue, and make a doctrine out of it. That becomes your doctrine in the church. That becomes what your church is based on. Instead of the word of God, instead of the love of Jesus Christ, it's based around that social doctrine. That's why Paul said, I preach him and him crucified, right? Because it... It is the only power to save a lost and dying world. And like I said before, that power doesn't come from taking sides. We're not social warriors and believers in Jesus Christ. We're not patriots and believers in Jesus Christ. We are believers and followers of Jesus Christ, period. Period. Doesn't mean you can't love your country. Doesn't mean you shouldn't speak out against social issues, especially if there's sins against God. It doesn't mean that. It means that when we do speak out, we speak out through the word of God, not through our emotions and our anger. Amen? Second, a church that stands for the truth is a church that is considered good in God's eyes. There's so many, so many false teachings out there. Doctrines are taken out of context. New doctrines are formed from the out-of-context doctrines, and that creates falsehoods and those falsehoods are taught in the church and the church body is buying into those false doctrines because they're not searching the scriptures for themselves listen the only absolute truth that we have in this world is Jesus just look at Facebook just look at all this stuff that's out there half of it is lies half of it is half truths you don't it's gotten to the point we don't know what to believe anymore Somebody sent me a video the other day. Now, I am not a fan of George Soros by any stretch of the imagination. We'll talk about him as we go through Revelation. But <clears throat> we have to, is right. But somebody posted a video of, of a protester that was being interviewed by somebody. And he said, the protester said he was being paid to protest. Now, listen, we do know that that's going on because... George Soros isn't personally sending anybody a check, but he supports organizations that do pay people to protest. But this particular guy said, yes, George Soros sends me a check personally with his name on it and has even invited me out to lunch if I'll get other protesters to. And I'm like, oh, my God. People are actually watching this and believing this? George Soros is not sending you a check with his name on it. I can guarantee you that. And if I'm wrong, please Please let me know. I'm willing to admit that I'm wrong. But that's what's out there. And people are buying it and, and eating it right up and then spewing it back out again. Creating more deception and more falsehoods. 
Listen, it is important, so important, to turn to the truth contained in the Word of God to combat the false doctrines. If you're not in here all the time, then you're in the world. The truth is in here. Now, sometimes we need to take what's going on in the, in the world to show how evil it is and where the Lord says we are in, in the end times, absolutely. But to believe everything we hear on the outside and make it doctrine, that's just contributing to the problem. A church that God considers a good church, number four, is a church that is a witness for Jesus Christ to the end of the earth and faithfully obeys the Great Commission. Jesus has opened a door now that's unprecedented for us as a church, as a body. We can spread the gospel message now from one continent to the other. I listen to my brothers all the time saying that more people are listening to their online services and their podcasts and their, their daily updates more now than ever before. Amir Tasfardi, one of my one of my one of the guys I love the most to listen to, his his media group has increased by tens of thousands of people. So the gospel message is being spread. I think I share with many of you, I had a, uh, my cousin, my dear cousin, said I haven't heard the word of God in 50 years. Thank you for putting it out on Facebook Live. And, and so it is, it is my honor and, and privilege, and, and I'm humbled by the fact that I get to reach people that I would never, the message of the gospel would never reach right, other than through Facebook Live and some of these platforms that are available to us. So we have an amazing, unprecedented door open before us right now to spread the gospel message. And Jesus has opened that door. What Satan meant for evil, by driving everybody inside and closing the doors, the Lord took and used it for good to spread the gospel message even further. Listen, when did the message spread the most in the book of Acts? When persecution came. Jesus said, go be a witness to me, right? To all the ends of the earth. What did they do? They went and huddled in Jerusalem. It was the holy huddle. And they stayed there. They were comfortable. It was nice. They knew the place. They knew everybody. It was easy until the persecution came and drove them to the four corners of the earth. And then the gospel message spread. God had to put the entire world in a time out to get his church to start spreading the gospel message. But he, that tells you just how important it is for that message to go out among the world. God will put the entire world in a time out because he loves the people of this world so much that he wants his church, his people, to spread the gospel message. The fifth point, the church that God considers good, is a church that's led by the Holy Spirit obeying his leading and guiding. The only power a church has is the power of the Holy Spirit. The only direction any church should ever go in is how the Holy Spirit leads. And the only counsel the church should ever seek is the counsel of the Holy Spirit and his guidance. Amen? Number six, it is a church that relies on God and not on their own resources. Listen, there's many today that believe the bigger and, and more things that a church has, the more blessings that God has bestowed upon it. And that may be true. But I think that a church that relies on God, has to rely on God for everything because it doesn't have the resources, it doesn't have the, the strength, is a, is a church that is truly blessed because we have to rely on Christ for everything. Amen? And number seven is a church that keeps and guards the word and obeys the word and trembles at the word. The word of God is under attack by the enemy. It always has been and always will be. And the best way to defeat the enemy is to know the word of God, to have it hidden in your heart. So those who know the word of God and keep the word of God in their hearts will never fall for the lies of the world. And number eight is it a church, it is a church that does not deny him in word or in deed. When we acknowledge, when we acknowledge rather that Jesus is who he says he is and we put him first in our life and we obey him in all that he says, we are acknowledging him that he is Lord and Savior of our lives. To preach a gospel, any, any other gospel but that, a gospel of love, a gospel of, of, of Jesus Christ and him crucified, a gospel of him risen and coming again for us, is to deny Jesus. To preach anything other than that 
is to deny Jesus. You know, we always say, yeah, it's the gospel. Yeah, the gospel could save lives, but yes, it's Jesus, and we know that Jesus changes lives, but we have to stop, we have to get rid of the buts. It's Jesus, period. That's our message. And our message only gets cloudied up and muddied up when we put the butts in. It's Jesus and him crucified, period. To not love our brothers and sisters, to not love others, to not love, period, is to deny Jesus. So this is, I think, right, this is the church that we want to be, isn't it? Is the bar set too high for us? Can we be this church? Well, not really. Not in our own strength, anyway. We can't do this in our own strength. We can only do this through the leading and guiding of the Holy Spirit by com committing and submitting to Him and Him only. Amen? So listen, if all of this is new to you, if you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior and you want what Jesus has to offer here, if any of this sounded appealing to you, if you want to be a part of what God is doing in the lives of millions of Christians around the world, or listen, if you realize that you fall short of what constitutes a good church in the eyes of God and you want to rededicate your life, it's as simple as A, B, C. And before we get into this, because this, as far as I'm concerned, is the most important part of the message, I just want to say that we're not going to do the keys in the message today because it is Agape Sunday, but you have the keys in the message, which include all eight of these points that I made today. And so what I'd like you to do is a little bit of homework is to go through them and ask yourself, is this me? Is this the church that I belong to? And if not, Lord, show me how I can get that trust. Because listen, I believe what we see around us, what's going on around us, is the Lord just taking the dross all around us and bringing it to the surface so that it could be skimmed away, making us pure and holy as his bride because he's coming back soon for his bride. And he wants his bride spotless and pure and ready for him. And so he's bringing this stuff to the surface for us to look at and get out of our lives. And so if you fall short of this and, and you need to rededicate yourself to the Lord or if you don't know the Lord, as I said, it's as simple as A, B, C. And the first letter of that is A, and it stands for admit. Admit that you are a sinner. Admit that you've fallen short of the glory of God, and that's exactly what the Bible tells us. There are none righteous. You may think you're righteous. You may think you're righteous in word and deed and in all the good things that you've done in your life. Just being a good person, you may think that's enough to get you to heaven, but the Bible contradicts that. The Bible says there is none righteous, no, not one. And that's, that means that none of your, your deeds aren't righteous, your words aren't righteous. There's nothing that you've done on your own in your own strength that's righteous. And then the Bible says for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And as we said earlier, that Jesus set the bar that you have to be perfect and spotless and holy to enter into heaven. That God can't even look upon sin. If all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, that presents a problem for who? For all. For all the world. So how do we, how do, how do we get past that? Well, you can on your own. The only way that you can be presented holy and righteous before God is by being covered by the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. By him imparting his righteousness to us. He exchanged our sin for his righteousness on the cross. And so that is the only way to become holy and righteous in the eyes of God, is to accept, admit that you're a sinner and accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And that's B. Believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and that he died for your sins. Believe also that he rose from the grave and is now seated at the right hand of God the Father interceding for us. And that his resurrection is a promise of our future resurrection. Without that, you stand before God guilty of your sin. Because, listen, we all live into eternity. It's no one, no one is buried and forgotten about. We all live in eternity. The question is, what will your address be in eternity? Romans 10, 10 and 11 say, For 
with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. You're not going to regret putting your faith and hope in Jesus Christ at the end. You're not going to regret it. I guarantee you will regret it if you stand there and have not accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior because when you're standing before God, it's too late. There are no second chances. You will never regret putting your faith in Jesus Christ ever. And see, call upon the name of the Lord, call out to Jesus, confess to him that you can't do this on your own, that you need him. The Bible tells us in Romans 10, 9, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. There's no loopholes here. You will be saved. There's no buts here. You will be saved. You don't have to get your life right and then come to Christ. Come to Jesus and he'll help you get your life right. Jesus will take us any way we come to him, but listen, he, and I know this is an old adage, but it's beautiful. He loves us way too much to leave us that way. There's no magic words to this. It's what you believe in your heart. If you believe in your heart that you're a sinner, if you believe in your heart that you need to change, and you believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins and is the Messiah, the Savior of the world, then you confess that with your mouth, and you will be saved. So listen, there's a prayer. We call it the sinner's prayer. You'll, we'll never find this anywhere in the Bible. But people sometimes need a little help putting what they think, especially new believers, into words. And so if you're listening to the sound of my voice this morning, those of you who have ears to hear, then I want to put it into a prayer for you. But this prayer is not a magic prayer. Just saying the prayer alone is not going to save you. It's believing in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord. Believing in your heart that he died for your sin. And so if you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, and you pray this with me this morning, you will be a part of the kingdom. You will be saved. And if you're here this, with us this morning and you need to rededicate your life because as you, we go through those eight points, you realize that you haven't even come close to living like that in your life. And as I said, the Lord is using this, using messages like this to stir up the dross in all of our lives, even me. He's stirring up the dross in all of our lives to show us what we need to get out of our lives. So if that means rededicating yourself to the Lord, then pray this prayer. Lord God, I realize that I am a sinner. I know that I have not been walking with you the way that I should. I've never known you before, Jesus, in my heart. I've heard of you. I've known of you, but I've never known you in my heart or from my heart. And so, Lord, I ask you now, as I place my faith in you as my Lord and Savior, as the Son of God and God the Son who raised from the dead, who died on the cross to give me eternal life, to cleanse me from my sin. Forgive me, Lord, of my sin. Forgive me, Lord, for not walking with you. Forgive me, Lord. Please forgive me. And help me to live for you. Fill me, Lord, with your Holy Spirit. Empower me to live this life and walk this walk as you intended for me to do. Go before me now, Lord Jesus. It is in your name that I pray. Amen. And listen, if you prayed that prayer, welcome, welcome to the family of Christ. And if you want to stay with us this morning, we're going to continue to run, and we are going to celebrate communion here this morning, and then we're going to go outside and chow down on some fried chicken. <laughs> listen, we're going to do communion a little differently this morning for those who are, you are here. Instead of coming up and, and avoiding tripping over the cameras and stuff, um, our deacons are going to hand out communion to you this morning. So I'm going to get you spoiled even more. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up now and get us ready for communion. If you're home um, in your pajamas watching church, having communion with us, now's a good time to, to get your elements ready.
what we do as a church here, we um, get the, commu- the elements and take them back to our seats, and then we all partake together. And that's what we'll be doing here this morning. Hopefully you're doing that with us at home. So listen, as the worship team plays, Jeff and Keith are going to come around and, and hand out the elements to you. The reason we celebrate communion is because Jesus said to us to do this in remembrance of him. So each time we partake of the communion elements, it's a reminder to us of how he shed his blood for us, how he gave his body for us. On the night he was betrayed, he took bread, blessed and broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body. So as we partake this morning of the bread which represents his body, the bread of life, Jesus is the bread of life, we remember that he willingly, lovingly gave himself over to be sacrificed. No one took his life from him. Didn't come as a surprise. The Romans didn't overpower him. Jesus gave his life for us. He laid his life down for us so that we could have eternal life, that our sins could be forgiven, washed clean, is forgotten as far as the east is from the west. The Bible says we were once stained red from sin, but now we are white as wool. What an amazing sight that is. Our slate has been wiped clean. We're a new creation. You know, I remember growing up in Catholic school, and, and for those of you who went to Catholic school, you remember the little uh, notebooks we used to get, the composition books? And you had to write in there so neat and so meticulous, or else my knuckles are still scarred from that. And so is my psyche. So just pray for me. <laughs> Explains a lot, right? But the th- point I was making was that every semester you got a new notebook. And so the other one, all the mistakes you made in it was kind of new and clean and crisp and you could start all over again. And you made more mistakes. But when we come to Christ, he wipes that slate clean. We're given a new book, if you will. It's it's crisp and clean and, and white and pure. And yes, we will make mistakes along the way. But Jesus says to us, just come to him. Come to that throne room of grace and you can obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. John tells us in his gospel that if we come to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 9. 
And it is amazing promise. So we don't have to be perfect, and we're not perfect. We just have to be humble enough to admit that we're sinners and ask him for his forgiveness. And we're going to do that for the rest of our lives as believers. So this morning, as we remember that sacrifice that he made for us, that enables us to be looking up and waiting for him, it is because of that sacrifice that we can say Maranatha, and we do believe, and we do look forward to him coming back for us. So let's partake. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. For this is the blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now until the day I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. And as you know, as you've done communion here for quite a while, most of you, that that is one of my favorite parts of that passage of Scripture. Because it is a promise from our Savior that we will get to do this in the marriage supper of the Lamb with him. We'll get to sit down with him. There won't be any mass. There won't be any social distancing. We get to sit with him and with each other as a family, sitting down to a family meal, a marriage supper. And so that means the greater promise there is that he's coming back for us, his bride. He's coming back for us. Sooner than I, we think, I believe, he's coming back for us. He's preparing us now for that day. Oh, how we look forward to that. And all the stuff we see around us, the viruses, the, the, the anarchy, all of it, we know because we know the end of this book is only going to get worse as time goes on. It's only going to get worse as the time draws near for him to come and rule and reign. But before any of that happens, he's going to scoop his bride up and remove us from here. And as we get into, we're very close now to chapter 4. It didn't take as many years that I thought it would. We're very close. And so when we get to 4, we'll talk about the rapture. But just to give you a little insight, think of your own bride. Would you want your bride to be left behind to face the tribulations and the trials and the things that are going to befall this world? No. You'd want to take your bride out of here. And that's exactly what our Lord's going to do. So as he promised us, we will sit at that marriage supper of the Lamb with him. And as we drink from this cup this morning, and it's a reminder of the blood that he shed for us to make us pure, to wash us clean, so that we can enter into heaven. So let's partake. Please stand. Please stand and join us in worship this morning on Facebook Live and on live stream. And God bless you guys. I wish, uh, wish you could be here to enjoy the chicken with us. And you can if you want to get down here in time. God bless you.